all my compliments all my compliments to Nora Schmidt. So I am not going to, I'm going to uh, sign off in one second, but let me just say again, I'm Eileen Matola from Hanford Township Parks and Recreation. We have a lot of good offerings and always feel free to call us or email us or the EAC if you have any questions about anything uh, or if you have an interest in something that we aren't doing or that they aren't doing. Um, and Joy, I don't know if you want to say something for a second about the EAC. And Joy, I am also going to make you the host. So at that point, you can just then turn so, it on to Nora. So the Haverford um, Township Environmental Advisory Committee, we usually call it the EAC. We meet once a month on Wednesday evenings from the first Wednesday of the month from 7.30 to 9.30 in the township building, um, the meeting room to the left of the commissioner's room. We also meet, it's a hybrid meeting. We also meet virtually. Um, if you're interested in um, getting the, the link, um, you can email haveswitch at gmail.com um, or you can just show up. Okay, great. So without anything else, more ado or whatever you say, Nora, take it away. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Eileen and Joy. Um, I'm actually going, my name is Nora Schmidt again. Um, I'm a water resources engineer at a local firm called AKRF. And we actually do a lot of stormwater projects. And so we've had some, some permeable paving projects come through us. And so that's, I've also brought in my coworker, Sandy Patunki, who is, can, has a lot more experience like with what it looks like afterwards and some, some maintenance issues and things like that on more of a large scale application, um, but has much experience um, that, can, that is applicable to a resident as well. So this is just, all right, let's, so, Here's like kind of what we're going to go through this evening. We're just going to talk about like what, why we are interested, why we would want to know more about porous paving and why we think it's relevant. Um, and then kind of like what it is and how it's designed, how it's then constructed, some design resources, maintenance cost, and some local contractors, because sometimes those are hard to find who know what they're doing. So, all right. So this is a handy dandy graphic that Philip, the Philadelphia Water Department to put together. And I think it pretty much really sums up like why we need to be concerned about stormwater and like what's running off your property and, and why we care. So like in your natural environment here, you have, you know, 40% is evaporation, 10, only 10% 10 is running off into your local waterway. And then, you know, the other 50% is going into the ground versus like in our built environment, in our like residential neighborhoods, in our cities, you know, it's going to be some sort of portion where over half is running off into your waterway. So we're kind of permeable paving is one of those options that tries to reduce the amount of runoff and, and promote temp, you know, infiltration into your, your landscapes in your, on your property. Also, if you, yeah, I'll, I'll go through this stuff, but if you have like a pressing question, feel free to like jump in. Otherwise I can answer questions at the end. All right, so you all know what a typical driveway is, is solid paving. Um, for this is a kind of an alternative way. This is not a porous driveway. It is just a means of reducing pavement so that you have less runoff, so you have infiltration that will occur in the green spaces in the grass, but it won't occur in this paving. Also, do I need to back up and I can talk about what infiltration is um, just to like kind of back up a little second about perbial paving because, so infiltration is anything that lands on a porous surface. So like anything that's has plants, has dirt, things like that. Um, Pavement has very little 
infiltration. Like you could, there's like dips and bumps in the pavement. So a little bit will get stored, but it won't infiltrate into the ground. The deeper the root system, the more infiltration because it can follow the root structure down further. So if we just reduce paving and just turn it to turf grass, that's one step in the right direction. All right, so then we can also do like, instead of your traditional sidewalk or path, you know, concrete pad, you can do stepping stones like this. So these, these two alternatives I think are pretty, you know, like a step in the right direction of what you can do to like get rid of some of the pavement on your property. Um, and it's not, you know, you don't need to do too much thinking. You can just ask your contractor. It'll be like, all right, I want two strips, you know, they're roughly like two feet wide and you'll be able to put that in. All right, so now we go, what is actual permeable paving? Um, and permeable paving is where you have either like this top layer is going to be what you're seeing on the ground and that's going to, this will itself will be, water will be able to go through this or if the brick will not be porous, but the in-between, you'll have spacing in between with stone and that will be porous. So it'll float, not float, sorry, infiltrate through the these different layers to get to your subgrade into the shallow infiltration um, setting. So this is a typical permeable paver setup. You can have other permeable pavements that are solid, that, but they all look roughly the same. They'll have a stone bedding underneath and some sort of edge restraint just to keep it all together. All right. Okay, so then here are the generically your three Ps, your paver, your permeable paver, which is probably the more applicable stance for a homeowner to do is put a paver in. You have permeable concrete, um, and then you have permeable asphalt. Uh, both of these permeable concrete and permeable asphalt we're not gonna talk about tonight because they are just, you know, the quad, they're based basically like infeasible for small projects because they just the amount of material you need to acquire to make this cost effective is in, inhibitive for small projects. Um, so, all right. So then, yes. Yeah, so then this is a good comment is like you can some driveways you've seen that look like this that aren't permeable because they'll have like literally mortar or concrete in between these gaps and that makes them impervious so it's the same as a typical asphalt driveway so what makes it permeable is when you put the stone or sand in between all right so now we get into this is what we're promoting as one of the more you know what homeowners can add to their property is these pavers so they'll come in like bricks they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors, but they'll typically have something like a little block um, that sticks out that kind of makes it, sets it up to have the difference between the two blocks. So it gives it space on its own. Um, so, and then this bottom picture did kind of a combination of that, you know, the easy to do pavement. So this is a standard concrete pad that with the two wheels, but then these, the patio is actually porous with the sand paving. And it doesn't have to be sand. You can actually put grass, you can make this, you know, put grass in between the blocks and yeah, it's kind of interesting. All right, so then there are these other options that are not, um, what do you call it, uh, pavers. And I'm gonna let Sandy talk about these because she she has a lot of experience and um, understanding of how these work. Sandy, you wanna jump in? If she's there. <laughs> All right. Well, Sandy can jump in it when she gets back. I think she must have stepped away. But um it is. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Thanks, yeah, Sandy. no, I, I was I think I think I think I was muted. Um uh, as Nora mentioned, um, you know, there's a variety of um, 
permeable pavement options. And uh, again, you know, I think the word permeable is, uh, I guess, the operative word in the sense that any, anything that lets water infiltrate. So, um, so um, you know, in addition to the options that NOR prevent, uh, provided, which are all, you know, based on like cementaceous materials, you know, ba basically they're just um, uh, sand and mortar, right? So like bricks are made of sand and mortar, um, obviously concrete is made of sand and mortar and asphalt, you know, has um, stone and then, you know, petroleum byproducts that bind it. Well, these materials, these, um, these polymer binders are slightly different in the sense that they're basically like glue and they just glue um, stone together to, um, you know, to e either be these sort of this porous pave or this gravel lock material. Um, and again, you know, you can use, um, and basically the, it's a binder material really. And, um, you know, these things can be used with the variety of, um, aggregates like uh you know the typical you know rough rough kind of we call them to be but you know the more angular like stone that you see in driveways and you can also even use them with like sort of more decorative and rounded stones and i've even seen like people you know put things like decorative glass if they want to do something like you know some decorative mulch for like a tree so um yeah, so that being said, you know, this is yet another option um, to use. Um, and I don't know, um, Nora, if you want to get into, you know, the pros and cons or where applications are, um, or I guess sort of like the best fit in terms of, you know, your site selection and where these things uh, really work best. Yeah, um, I think we should definitely get into those um, if you have comments on this is these are products I don't necessarily know too much about so if you have know where these are work best that we... yeah yeah um I think that you know well, for these applications um if you want to have I guess really you know some of this this is really driven driven by aesthetics so for example like if you have um you know a very naturalized setting like for example um you know, if you had a garden path or something and you wanted something to look really natural and you just wanted things to look like, you know, it's just a, a gravel path that has the benefit of, you know, not washing away every time it rains and your gravel getting all over your, you know, your planted beds, you know, I think this is a, an option to go. Um, you know, I think that being said, I think these materials do require a little bit of, um, expertise I think when you're laying it down again you know it's just a it's it's basically a glue material so um you know so from from that perspective um you know it, it, I think it does require a little bit of you know testing to see like you know what works and um you know probably I would recommend you know at least getting a contractor on board if you're planning to use either of these um the you know these uh porous paver that's gravel log which are again like these are two proprietary products so i think there are other stuff out there as well that will work um yeah i think we can probably get into some of the like, pros and cons of all of them in a little bit i just want yep. to grab the one this is the one other option that is more accessible um for homeowners is this kind of plastic paver which is you know, in the in our world called a geogrid, you can do geogrids can be used for like slope stability, you know, pathways, walls, like there's so many different uses for these, but then there are these widely available in different shapes. This is a hexagon, so the circle, different kind of versions of these where you put plastic kind of grid formations that interlock. Um, they're pretty easy to lay down. You just like you grade out your surface and lay these down and then you just put stone on top of it. And they're all rated for different kind of weight loads. So you can have ones that you have cars on or just pathways. Um, and these, you know, pretty, the basic, basic function of these is that, all right, so this is an open bottom grid for the most part and you put the stone in and then this 
the grid holds the stone there and allows the water to infiltrate through the grid. So it's kind of a more, and you could use, and you could probably even use the like gravel lock uh, material, like the glue in here as well, but it's not necessary. So. All right, so these are, this is what we were kind of getting into of like thinking about what, where you want to put permeable paving and what type of permeable paving if you're thinking about it. So like, you know, the first and foremost is like, what do you want to use it for? Like, do you want to park your car on it? Do you want to just have it be a sidewalk? Is it a patio? That kind of thing. And then is it going to continue to be those things? If you think, you know, like maybe I won't be using that as a sidewalk, maybe, maybe then you can get rid of the sidewalk completely. And also you do need to definitely know like how much weight you're going to put on it. Are you going to be parking your car or are you just going to walk on it? Because that will, as you see, a saw kind of, you can't use those proprietary glue um, type forest paving. And then a big one is, you know, kind of knowing how much water is going to get to your driveway. Because if you have a creek running through your driveway, it's probably not going to be great for a porous asphalt or porous driveway either. Um, for the most part, you, it can handle most a lot of a decent amount of run on. Um, but you wouldn't also want it to have if you're if you're running off from your garden and it's full of mulch or full of sand from, you know, a sandbox or something like that. We don't. You don't want that because you don't want to have that sand and the mulch and all that stuff running off, basically clogging up the pores of your porous pavement. Um, and we'll get to the maintenance later on, but there are ways you can mitigate, you know, in a, you know, clean your porous pavement after the fact. But if you can avoid it, avoid placing it in those locations to begin with, that's preferred. And then, so as you saw in the, I guess a few slides ago with that cross section with this stone and then all the way down to the sub base where you're promoting infiltration, the higher your infiltration rate, like the more pore space that's available for your water, for, for the water to go through, the higher your infiltration rate is. So like the more water you can infiltrate from your porous pavement. So not to say you can't have porous pavement if you have low infiltrating soil or poor soil. It just would just kind of changes how you think about it. Like Maybe you don't want to have a lot of run on if you have poor soil. You can just treat just your driveway. And this is just a generic rule of thumb. Most homeowners probably won't necessarily know the depth of your water table, um, but we usually try to avoid putting porous or infiltrating anything within two feet of your water table. Um, but I think mostly in Havertown in the Delco area, I think where in most of your houses are like slightly elevated most of the time. So this shouldn't be an issue. And also slope of your, like of your driveway, if you have a very steep slope, that's also not, um, like if you have a big hill and your driveway sloping down a lot, like it's not, the, not super ideal, but it's still better than a, um, a typical asphalt driveway because the, the larger the slope, the less time basically that your water can infiltrate. It's gonna go, it's gonna go the path of least resistance. It's gonna slide right back down into your gutter into the street instead of infiltrating if you have like a very high slope. All right, we talked about the sediment loading and then just you know, just knowing if you're putting new pavement down, you would do a PA1 call just to make sure you're not like hitting any utilities. All right, so Sandy, I didn't give you an intro, but Sandy, Sandy works with me at AKRF and she does construction and she's a landscape architect. So these are all, this is like her kind of forte. So maybe if you wanna talk about some of these construction issues. Maybe. Sure, um, you know, I think in the examples that are in the photos that um, Nora's presented here, um, probably, you know, the most applicable thing are probably the, so um, everything, I guess, except for the, like the bottom, the bottom right one, um, 
um, in the sense that, you know, in, so in, um, in sort of more, uh, I guess, intensive, like municipal yes. and I guess just bigger stormwater management that we do um, at ACARAF, um, you know, we'll all, oftentimes we'll combine um, different stormwater capture systems that are you know stacked on top of one another or like one in parallel on top of an another. So what you're seeing on that right um, bottom corner there is just like a fairly deep system that we actually put in in an alleyway where um, you know there's multiple cells um, beneath the actual porous porous um, pavement itself that you know um, detain water and then um, slowly releases it over time. So. You know, for most homeowners, like something like what you're seeing on that um, bottom right hand corner is, you know, probably not as applicable because again, it's, you know, it, that's really for um, a much more intensive, you know, stormwater capture that we're doing. So that being said, um, you know, with porous um, asphalt um, or, or, or actually porous asphalt concrete and um, pavers, um, the thing that you really have to be mindful about is that you really want to make sure that um, you preserve the integrity of the um, the porousness, right? So you don't want anything that's going to compromise it, like having, um, you know, construction materials or dirt or soil or any kind of material that are going to, you know, plug, either clog your little... Um, uh, the joints in your pavers that really lets your water uh, percolate to the soil below. So that being said, you know, you really want to make sure that when you're building your, um, your, you know, your porous pavement um, uh, feature, you know, whatever that may be, either a driveway or a patio or anything, you really want to make sure that you're not having like material running onto the site. So, you know, making sure that you're, if you're going to have a stroll stockpile area for any of the excavation that you're doing, you're keeping that downstream of your pavement. So I think, you know, that's probably first and foremost during construction. That's probably the most important thing, um, you know, in, in terms of making sure that you're preserving the, uh, uh, the integrity of the, your, your pavers. You also want to make sure that, you know, your sub base preparation is um, is um, you know according to spec and again I you know I think as far as specifications are concerned obviously like any good contractor is going to know like how to prepare the your base well after you excavate everything to make sure that you're not like overly compacting it or you're um, or you know or it's not too mushy and you have like soft spots so um, you know there's um, you know, vendors will have really good guidance as far as like how to prepare, um, you know, not only the, the, the surface, like the swell surface, the excavated surface where your pavers are going to go in. And again, you want to make sure that it's not, you know, wet, it's not, you know, you don't have like um, uneven spots. And, uh, and uh, it's essentially that it's, you know, prepared to be, um, even and um, or or you know to, to be graded in, in the sense that it needs to be graded, and then there's just um, and then there's no like um, uh, you know drainage issue with the swell itself. So yeah. so sort of like those are the two big things. But beyond that, you know, as far as like porous pavers are concerned, your installation is pretty pretty typical to how regular um, pavers get installed. Um, usually there's sort of a, some sort of edge restraint that keeps the pavers in place. Um, and, you know, the paver, the restraint can be, you know, a variety of different materials. They could be, you know, a concrete edging. Um, it could be, um, you know, a metal strip. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend like some of the plastic edging just because I think over time they can shift a little bit, but, you know, that being said, you know, they can be used. And, um, uh, you know, just, just making sure that, you know, the, the edge is stable and um, it's, you know, 
installed securely. Um, and there's also specifications as far as like, you know, sort of the tolerances that you will want for your actual paver surface, which is that you don't want to have a deflection of less than like an eighth of an inch over 10 feet. Again, you know, that's the standard practice for like any good um, paver installation so that you don't have, you know, bird bats or sort of like low spots in any uh, one place. Um, beyond that, I think, uh, you know, with these um, pavers, um, the joint material is a, um, a different gradation of sand that's, you know, that's, that's selected so that it, they don't, pack tightly um, you know you want to make sure that the joint material is designed for you know this application and uh, you want to make sure that you know when they're installing it's you know swept in properly and you probably will have to uh, you know and the contractor will probably have to come back in and probably after a couple of months where things have settled a little bit and maybe lay top things off um, so I think really those are the main three points is that, you know, keep anything that's going to clog the pavers um, off to the side. Um, you know, make sure that your, your contractor is following specifications, you know, per the manufacturer or, um, you know, whatever guidance you're using. And then, um, and then making sure that uh, you know the after everything's installed that you know the the contractor will come back in and check it and um, fix any um, defects. You know, and again, we can really certainly go into you know um, any good and and then actually you know any good landscape architect or any um, really designer. Um, will have like fairly strict specifications as far as how, you know, you, the, how things need to be installed. And um, so this is where, you know, probably getting the guidance of some, a professional when you're really doing this uh, to get their input, um, I, I think is really valuable because again, you don't want to invest, you know, in a $30,000 driveway that has like a, one spot where you know everything just sort of is just holding water so okay. all right so we kind of got say you kind of got into a bunch of like design related like topics like like you said the co if you have a contractor they should there are a bunch of contractors that have done porous paving and per previous uh pavers and they will know how to do it. But if you like decide you wanna go your way and <laughs> design it yourself, there's this, I, this design guidance is like for homeowners. Um, I, I, I also can share the PDF, but, or, but this design guidance from Montgomery County, Maryland was, is really, really good for like homeowners, like driveway type things. All right, so Sandy touched on how much, like if you're, you could be spending $30,000 potentially on a driveway. Um, so I just thought we, here's the generic cost. So like for a porous paver, in porous, you know, paver driveway, you're going to spend $30 to $50 per square foot um, compared to, you know, le less than half of that, four to 15 per square foot for your standard concrete driveway. So yeah, it is much, you know, it's, double almost more than that um cost so it is something to be aware of but you know you can go the way of doing like just the strips of paving um just doing some sidewalk just doing whatever you know you know if you were going to do a typical paver driveway without the porous like it's probably it's going to be in the realm of that cost as well um and you are retaining stormwater on your property reducing flooding in downstream. Um, so those are, there's, I think, some of the benefits outweigh the increase in cost. All right, so here's, we're touching on this maintenance aspect. So just preventative, what you want to do, like when you're in construction, avoid, you know, place all your debris down, down slope of the project. But once you have installed it, you're going to need to remove it. Um, don't dump 
don't dump a pile of a truckload of sand on top of it, a truckload of anything on top of it. Um, if you can, you know, so remove it and sweep it. Um, yes. And then, you know, after a rain event, just, you know, just kind of like look out, see how it's doing. If it's ponding in a weird spot, like maybe there's something clogging it and you can just like brush it off. Um, and then, yeah, just don't store anything. Just don't, and then don't put anything loose nearby. Like if you can have a strip of grass and then your mulched garden bed, that's preferable. All right. So then winter maintenance. So I mean, our winters are getting a little less icy, but, and snowy, but when snow does accumulate, um, since it is more in, I guess we, we've said like sometimes they porous paving might actually, you know, help with ice a little bit, but um, you don't, it won't like ice over faster. It won't, it's not going to be very, really that much different than your typical pavement. Um, and if you have somebody scrape your driveway, uh, we, you want to have like a rubber edge or a hand shovel. We don't want to like be pushing things around and messing up the porous nature. Also, don't use salt. Um, they can damage the actual chemical qualities, I think. Um, and just, so just use sparingly and not just don't use if you can avoid it. And then, like Sandy said, the contractor might have to come out a few weeks later, maybe, you know, a year later, you might yourself have to add some sand or small stones in between the joints just because things do move around. So that's okay. All right, so there are a bunch of local contractors. These were a few just specific ones in, in the Havertown, you know, Delco area. But the Philadelphia Water Department has a, a list of contractors and they, that do porous pavement. And it tells you in this list exactly what they do. Um, and these are all people that have worked with the Water Department in their local residential program. So these, I know, yeah, these specific contractors, I would, and they're all over, you know, the area, some over in Delaware County. Um, so I would start in this list first, just because they have, you know, they're vetted by a, another county, another city. Um, so, all right. And then, yeah, so this is my email. This is Sandy's email um, if you have questions, but we'll take questions now, I guess, too. I think there were some questions in the chat too. Um, all right. So we said the range of depth of the subsurface materials needed. Um, yeah, Peter responded, it says, so for all of your porous surfaces, we'd want um, at least, yeah, at least six inches of bedding, which is typical of actually your standard concrete and you know, asphalt, you want something underneath there to just bed your material in. And then if you can have more stone, then you have more, basically the stone has a void in between each of the particles. And so the more void space you can add by deepening the stone storage, the, the more you're gonna store when you're infiltrating. And all right, so then porous, Joey asked, are porous pavers something that is available in big box stores or rock or stone and stone dealers? Um, I know, like, I know you can get the, like the geo grid, the plastic grid systems there. Those are widely available in box stores. Um, I'm not too sure about like, you can buy pavers at like a Home Depot and then just not mortar them in between. Sandy, do you have any? Yeah, no. Um, the pavers are specifically manufactured to have little, um, they're like little fence on the side, so that yeah. they're, um, so that they're always kept at a certain, you know, distance from one another. And that's really, um, so they are manufactured to, you know, specific tolerances. So that being said, like any good. Um, you probably won't be able to get go to like a big box store, but probably like you can you can probably go to any store that 
or any vendor that sells just hardware materials, um, you know, especially like paving materials. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, uh, for example, like near my house, um, which is sort of like in Montgomery County, um, Allied uh, Landscape Supply is one place that would probably carry something like that. And certainly like you, you can also, um, you know, if you, um, there's a couple of big manufacturers that make them like uh, Belgar makes them, there's like paved stones. And again, I think we can certainly share that information with you. So I think, you know, if you go to any of their websites, they will usually have a, a locator that sells these products. So I think, um, you know, I think they, they can be, um, they're not, they, they're, they're not impossible to, you know, get a hold of. And if you are working with a contractor, they will be able to source, you, you source them for you and whatever you want them to look like, they'll, they'll be, they can find them. Um, and yeah, we can, I can share this PowerPoint, which has the links embedded in afterwards, right, Joe, you have, do you have a list of everyone or I, I guess Eileen does at least. Eileen, um, yes. So she'll be able to, if, if you share it with me or Eileen, then when the, um, she sends out um, the information about the recording, she'll also send out the slides. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Um, we can explain more things, answer questions. I have a question about like, and I'm sure this depends on the um, the the product, but how much better is having the these materials down versus just grass if it's not sloped? Right. That's that's a good question. I think well, grass. So like, if we get back to like, how deep is your storage? Kind of, if you think about it that way, and how how much void space, how much area does is there for water to go? Grass and soil have very little, you know, the, the typical grass is like the, the root zone is what, like one to three inches type thing. So you're only getting pretty clean you know, and that's what's disrupting the clay. Say, I think Sandy, you could speak to this because you know. Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> um, so I think it really depends on what your application is, you know, if, um, Obviously, if you want to have a paved area, again, you know, paved being the operative word here, um, these materials are much better than, you know, doing something that is not porous, like just, you know, regular asphalt or regular concrete. So um, if you want, you know, a, a, a driveway, um, obviously you wouldn't necessarily want to keep a driveway as grass, right? So you, if you put a paved driveway, then, you know, going the route of doing the porous is better than going standard. But that being said, um, you know, if being all things equal, really like the best thing is, you know, obviously not to, if you don't need to disturb the soil and you just, you know, it's just things are just vegetated. Um, even if it's grass, that's literally like, you know, that's, the grass will be more permeable than, you know, um, either of these things. So, or like the, the porous pavement options. So really, so the question is, you know, is it better? It really, it's the question is, it's better if it's, it's a better product if, you're, if your intention is to, is to have an area that's paved. But if it's not paved, then just keep it as, you know, vegetated, like as grass or just other plantings. I was just thinking for a driveway, if somebody was considering doing these um, pavers, these porous pavers versus like the two strips. Um, I see. <clears throat> I mean, I would think that the cost of the two strips would be far less than Correct. the porous pavers. Sure, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And, and again, um, you know, um, 
back to basics, right? I mean, if somebody just wanted something to be porous, they could they could just have a gravel driveway. I mean, that's, you know, that's sort of like the gravel driveway, sort of like the mother of all like paved, you know, sort of semi-paved option and porous. Um, but that's correct. I think uh, if you're looking at, um, you know, just sort of those concrete strips, I think that um, the last time I put an estimate together, I think, you know, uh, a pavement, it's probably about $25 per square foot. Um, like, yeah, between like, yeah, depending on how much base and everything you have, but, you know, it, I think it's anywhere from like 16 to $24, depending on the thickness of your concrete and your base. So, uh, you know, so, so in some ways, um, it's, it's uh, obviously it's sort of like, you know, your square footage, right? Your square footage for those little tire strips is gonna be less than like if you were to drive, like pave over your, paver over your whole driveway, so. Yeah, I did wanna throw my two cents in, this is Peter, uh, about, you know, grass versus porous. So grass, it really depends on, you know, the soil condition. So yep. most grass is highly compacted. Um, and if there's any slope to it, it's really not gonna absorb very much water. Um, I actually have porous pave in walking areas uh, past the end of my driveway. And I mean, the water just disappears even in a heavy rain, you know, because it was constructed with a lot of underlying uh, stone. Um, and so, these things actually do perform if they're constructed correctly and maintained. Um, somebody asked the question in the chat about, oh, I've got a slope driveway. That, that's a design challenge. So a slope driveway is gonna run off like crazy, period, right? You know, so the more the, the the more slope, the quicker things run off, whether it's grass or paving or anything. I think for something like this, you can get some benefit out of it, but it's a design challenge because you sort of have to create terraces in order to impound water. If you put in, you know, a foot or eighteen inches of gravel over a sloped bottom the water is going to go through and then it's going to run across the bottom and it's going to come out at the end of the driveway. <laughs> so you, but there, you know, you could be a little bit more creative about designing it so that it does actually hold and permeate, you know, but there's, you know, there's other solutions to like, you know, you can, uh, put a, a trench drain at the end of a driveway and take the water into a rain garden and uh, on the front of your lawn or something like that. So th there's a lot of different strategies, um, but, but slopiness tends to be more challenging in general. Yeah, and if you could get away with um, just the two strips of concrete, that might be the, Easiest, best bet, you can reduce your impervious footprint. But because, you know, some of those like the gravel um, geogrids with the gravel that just sits in it, it's going to on a slope, um, a big rainstorm might wash away some of that. So I think, yeah, but like Peter said, there are a lot of different ways that you can kind of daisy chain a few things together. So if you have you know, you want to like if your pavement like flows over and doesn't go directly into the street, but you're you're flowing from your driveway onto your yard, you can you know, take the runoff from your driveway and do something in your yard instead of retrofitting your driveway. Um, so you can put in more plantings, you can put in a rain garden, a swale, these trench drains, some of those things um, require, you know, some more design effort. Some of them just planting, adding your, adding additional roots zones close to your runoff. 
remotes infiltration. Um, yeah, we're just mostly like the whole goal is to reduce the runoff, reduce what's run leaving your property. And all the questions in this chat. Oh yeah, thanks for sharing that list, Peter. Yeah, by, by the way, so my porous pave experience is um, I have a corner uh, roof downspout that the water runs off so quickly that it's always been a waterfall over the edge forever and ever. And that sort of exposed one of the weaknesses of porous pave. So that's, there's a big divot right there where that waterfall hits the porous paving. Um, and, you know, the other lesson learned is porous pave is really difficult for a contractor to do a good job. They really have to be skilled. Uh, you definitely don't want it for a, a vehicle on um, I think uh, some of the arboretums I've seen porous pave as walking paths. I think that's the best right. application for it. Yeah, uh, it, you know, I think it's, again, I think it goes, comes back to aesthetics. Um, it looks really natural um, or naturalized, I guess. And I, I know someone who installed gravel lock. The advantage for a do it your I don't think I would ever recommend a do it yourself or to do porous pave. Uh, gravel lock, you could actually set decorative stone. And this fellow actually did like patterns. Uh, and he, he worked with uh, his, his, he has a, he had a gardener and he worked with his gardener. And so he did the whole thing, laid everything in, compacted it, and then you you actually pour this polymeric material, you kind of sprinkle it over it and it sets. And uh, to me, that sounded like a much uh, easier way to do it than what I saw my contractor do the porous pave, which, you know, they were mixing it up in a mixing everything up together in like a little concrete mixer. And then it, it's like beat the clock uh -huh. to get yeah. it in. And I think they didn't really understand the fact that you have to, you can't just screed it like you screed concrete. Um, you really have to kind of, um, you know, work it in enough to get it to, uh, you know, to get it to, to, be strong enough, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. But so a little more challenging. I actually had a question for the people who um, have are participating in this discussion. Um, and if you can just put it in the chat, um, what made you um, sign on for this uh, webinar? Um, are you interested in um, changing your driveway, um, sidewalk, um, just walking paths around your house. I'm just curious to see what the need uh, or the interest is of our community. Or if you're just interested. Well, so while everyone is doing that, I, I will offer again, you know, other alternatives. Um, you know, Joy herself just got a rain garden that captures her entire driveway. And sometimes you're lucky enough that the water runs naturally without doing, uh, you know, heroic measures like saw cutting the pavement and putting in a trench drain, um, you know, you could actually get it to run to a location where you could put in a rain garden. So that's that's always an alternative as well. Yeah, 
And I th honestly, maybe a little easier <laughs> if you get it through the, if you live in Haverford Township, you get your rain garden through that program. Yeah, so here's the plug. So Peter um, helps run the Have a Rain Garden program. So for those who don't know, um, you can email have a rain garden at gmail.com to get your um, property assessed that um, and um, they have arranged for grants for, uh, that funds the program and lots of volunteers. Um, so there's some plantings going on. Um, Peter, maybe you could put the sign up in the, the um, chat. Um, so there's more going in this season. Um, and the goal is to get 100 rain gardens in Haverford Township in 10 years. You're on year eight or seven? No? Yeah, I think this is year eight. And uh, yeah, we've got something like, we're, we're approaching 80 rain gardens now, I think. Um, Jen, I guess, noted that she needs to offset uh, the, an addition to a house. So that problem, I, I think everything that you've heard today might be useful to you, but that is one application which you really need a professional. So an engineer needs to design something uh, to offset uh, the impervious area that they will stand behind and that the, that the township will accept and issue a permit for the addition. So that's a little bit more complicated than a do-it-yourself project or you know, even what I did with permeable paving, which was just hire a landscaper who knew how to do it, although they didn't have that much experience <laughs> with it, I think, as it turned out. But um, I, you know, you, you see with like additions and even some new construction like uh, semi-attached subdivided properties where a contractor will get a design that actually uses a storage bed under a driveway to, to detain and infiltrate um, stormwater. Um, so, I mean, this concept could, could definitely be used to, to do that. But I think the burden of proof in terms of getting a permit often means that you're, you have an engineer who's designing it. Hopefully that makes sense. But um, yeah, I mean, everything that you heard here is hopefully going to be useful to um, uh, to it. I think when it comes to the um, you know when it comes to uh, an addition to a house, that really should be part of the scope of whoever's designing the addition. And if they need to bring on a civil engineer to do that aspect of it, um, sometimes uh, you know they'll put in. Uh, a rock bed and infiltrate. Um, you know, you see this sometimes with new developments where all the roof drains are actually piped underground and the underground pipe goes into an underground catchment um, and that's designed to hold water and infiltrate it slowly into the ground. So that's another strategy uh, as well that's used for, you know, new home construction oftentimes. Unlike the old home construction where the underground pipe goes to the, the street. Sometimes to the street, right, which is the opposite of what you'd like to see. So that just express, it's an express route to get to the street and into the storm sewer and into the streams, which you really don't want to see. Right. Yeah, I didn't. I think there were some other you can incorporate, like you said, drainage underneath your forest paving, too, if you want to increase your storage even further than eight, like six to 18 inches, you can go even deeper than that, too. Yeah, one of the my pet peeves on new construction and additions, uh, 
Well, I mean, I have a lot of pet peeves because I've and I'm in the rain garden. Uh, I don't want to say business hobby <laughs> at a crazy level hobby, but um, you know, so you just see a lot of things that just continually is increasing impervious areas, like people doubling the width of their driveways and. Um, you know, putting little drives across their front lawn and stuff like that, which, um, you know, just doesn't help the situation. Um, I think now you can't, uh, by, you know, ordinance, you can't put a pipe to the street unless you get like a special exception, but th there, it's much, it's more difficult to get that kind of exception. And, and but years ago, they used to pipe things directly to the street and you still see a lot of that. Yeah. So I guess the, the minimum, if anybody could do is if you have anything piped to the street, trying to pull that out um, and run it over your yard is usually the preferred method. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea to, you know, if you have paths to the front door, um, I just love the look of like a natural stone. And so, you know, a little, um, you often see this, you know, instead of a concrete walkway to the front door, you'll see a little slate path. Um, and it's a little, <laughs> some of these things are a little harder to deal with, like, you know, shoveling the slate is difficult, obviously. Um, but um, I have that, I sort of have that situation. I actually have an old two concrete runner driveway that the former owner actually excavated, I guess the dirt in between it. And he laid in old repurposed bricks with sand underneath. So I sort of have a pervious driveway, not like really, really, it's not gonna accept a huge amount of water but uh, it's so flat that the water just sits in there and, per you know, it's going to hold <laughs> an inch of water and percolate it before it starts running out to the street. So. All right. Um, anybody have any last thoughts, questions? I don't see any more chats, so. So, um, yeah, I, I did put the have a rain garden email address. If you live in Haverford and you're interested in a rain garden, just send an email with the address phone number and we'll get you uh, on the list to get an invitation to be assessed. Um, I also wanted to put in a pitch for um, the uh, Stream Smart, Stormwater Stream Smart assessments. Uh, uh, Nora, do you remember who's doing that now? Is it DCVA? Um, or the um, Jamie's program? Isn't yeah. That, um... If you search for Stream Smart. Um, Alarming and Conservancy and um, what is she? Uh, the collaborative she works at. Right. And so they'll come to your house and do an assessment and sort of give you uh, some recommendations of things that you can do, um, whether, you know, th but they won't actually um, like do a rain garden like you can get with Haverford. Um, although, you know, conditions have to be right in order for you to get a rain garden, but um, but they will do things, uh, recommend things like stormwater planters, rain barrels, uh, give you advice about the suitability of, of the property for a rain garden. Um, and they, they should be able to give you advice on things like permeable paving. And I'd like to plug, I put in the Lower, Conser uh, Lower Mary Conservancy Stream Smart website. And, I, and right above that, I put in the chat, the uh, HaverfordClimateAction.org. So this is a fairly new website that 
um, members of the EAC and together with the Civic um, Association has put together um, all, if, as long as it's okay with Nora, um, mm -hmm. we'll put a link to this talk yeah. and some of the information from the talk um, will load it onto the website. There's information about the rain gardens there and other things that you can do. Um, there's, there's, you can get um, reduced cost rain barrels um, through, I forgot the name of the organization, but all that, all those links are there um, for other things that, that you might be interested in doing to, to both um, reduce stormwater as well as, which is kind of like a climate um, uh, adaptation, uh, but there's also climate mitigation um, strategies on there as well. All right, well, thank you for having me. This was, this was fun. So uh, if you do want Stream Smart and you're in Haverford, I think you're gonna have to go to dcva.org. I don't think Lower Marion uh, Conservancy will do it for us. Um, I'll drop that in. Uh, yeah, so that's a link for, if you're in Lower Marion, I think the Lower Marion Conservancy is the place to go. I think in Haverford and most of the Darby Cobbs watershed, it would be DCVA. Thank you everybody for coming and um, I'll have um, Eileen um, send out a, the copy of the slides and um, again the recording. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. <laughs>